Jesuit in the Pulpit The following commentary is based on principles laid out in the Jesuit Oath of Induction. All scenarios and explanations are consistent with experiences reported by certain individuals, including former priests. For your further research, I will provide some references at the end of the video. Most Christians are unaware that there are Jesuits in the pulpits of churches everywhere in the world. How do we know this? One need only reference the Jesuit Oath of Induction to confirm that this is one of their mandates. For example, the oath states, quote, You have been taught to act the dissembler. Among Protestants, generally, to be a Protestant to seek even to preach from their pulpits." Unquote. A dissembler is one who professes beliefs contrary to their true beliefs, usually for the purpose of deception or gain of some sort. Furthermore, the oath allows Jesuits to deny Roman Catholicism, its states, and to denounce with all vehemence in our nature our holy religion and the Pope. Unquote. Jesuits in the pulpits are also permitted to deem the Roman Catholic Church heretical insofar as it serves Rome's agenda. For example, the oath states, quote, I am dispensed with to assume my religion heretical for the propaganda of the Mother Church's interest. Unquote. However, being able to, without a shadow of a doubt, confirm that the pastor in your pulpit is a Jesuit is very difficult. Deception is the Jesuits' primary area of expertise. They are experts par excellence in this regard. If they were not, they would not be in the pulpits of churches everywhere. So when we are suspicious of a pastor, be assured that if he is in fact a Jesuit, he will say anything necessary to dispel that suspicion, including denouncing the Pope pointing out errors in the Roman Catholic doctrine and even denouncing the Roman Catholic Church. He will teach basic biblical doctrines acceptable to most Protestants and Baptists, though usually through the lens of dispensationalism, futurism, or preterism, and never from historicism's view of Antichrist. It is the Jesuit pastor's objective to remain invisible at any cost never appearing duplicitous, or a dissembler, or an agent of Rome, but never conclusively naming Roman Catholicism as the Antichrist and the consummate enemy of Christ and his true Church. Though it is difficult to identify a card-carrying Jesuit in the pulpit, there are some telltale signs to watch for. For that, one must look outside the official declarations of the pastor in question and examine his suspicious tendencies that are not in plain view to the congregation, but can only be discerned over time and by putting the pieces together and identifying common denominators. One must become something of a detective. Because Jesuits in the pulpit are given the mandate to sow discord, they do this very carefully trying to avoid appearing as the common denominator of discord, but rather appearing to act out of moral concern for the body of Christ. And in this function, they know how to use the scripture to support their words and actions, making themselves appear as agents of good, while making those they are targeting appear as agents of evil and the cause of discord. Yet the unassailable fact remains. The Jesuit in the pulpit is a common denominator of discord among those within his congregation and without. Upon examining the fruit of his ministry among congregants and non-congregants over time, this becomes apparent. Thus, in this regard, a Jesuit in the pulpit, if he is in fact that, will have a history of discordant relationships with those and others that appear to be part of his denomination or biblical community. In other words, the Jesuit in the pulpit is usually at the center of discordant relationships, despite the fact that it may appear on the surface that he has the moral and biblical high ground. This can be very confusing because often he does have the moral high ground and is biblically sound in his apparent concerns and behaviors. 
Yet he remains the common denominator of discord. He is at the center of it among those with whom he would seem to have the most in common, and he is an expert at using every situation to further his cause, and he is especially adept at twisting the scriptures to his advantage. The Jesuit pastor in this regard thrives on conflict and looks to capitalize on conflicts when they appear naturally in his circle of denominational associates. He need not start conflicts, but merely watch for them to arise and capitalize on them. Thus he will move predictably from conflict to conflict, never having actually engineered the conflicts himself, though not loath to create and stimulate conflict when he can without detection. When he feels he has achieved his objectives in each situation, he moves to the next, never seeming to pastor peacefully among the brethren for any extended period of time. The Jesuit in the pulpit stretches conflicts as far as he can, never appearing to know when to quit, or remain silent and let the matter rest for the sake of preserving unity among the brethren. To sustain conflict, such a pastor will most often override the facts of a given situation with innuendo, veiled personal insults, and inflammatory language, hoping to provoke anger on the part of his subject, knowing that anger produces inappropriate responses that can later be used against the person with whom he is communicating. The keen observer of the Jesuit in the pulpit can see that resolution of conflict is not the pastor's objective, but sustaining conflict as long as possible, without ever appearing to be the cause of its sustenance. This Jesuit deceiver will often appear to act in his own worst interest, readily engaging in conflict with leaders of other congregations, even those that support his ministry. This complete disregard for self-preservation again sends up red flags, as it is not normal to bite the hand that feeds. And Jesuits in the pulpit will most often do this, much to the confusion of the observer. Yet if one understands that the Jesuit mandate is not predicated so much on self-preservation or personal gain, but upon sowing and stimulating discord, then it makes sense. A Jesuit in the pulpit will have a history of appearing to behave irrationally in such matters. Yet, to the informed Jesuit watcher, it is further evidence of his true hidden objectives. The Jesuit pastor is careful never to let anyone get too close personally, as they know certain inconsistencies will become apparent if observed often enough. For this reason, there is often little private interaction between the Jesuit in the pulpit and members of the congregation. There is a mystery about certain things regarding his home life, his private life, and his relationships with family and friends not associated with the church group. This may not be extant in every case of every Jesuit in the pulpit. But where it is obvious to the observer, red flags should go up, as the scriptures declare that a pastor is to be hospitable beyond the call of duty, opening his home and life up to the church without reservation. A Jesuit pastor in the pulpit with something to hide will be very cautious about social interactions with individuals in the congregation beyond the immediate confines of official services and events involving everyone in the church. It is important to remember that the Jesuit in the pulpit has an official story, and the facts of that story can be confirmed as true. This is not the problem. Rather, to the Jesuit watcher, it is the many unanswered questions that fall between the events and facts of the pastor's official story. Because of this, the Jesuit watcher will feel that they are being fed information on a need-to-know basis, and the official story may be a little too consistent to be the whole truth. 
This leaves the observer with nagging questions that he or she may not feel comfortable confronting the pastor with. For example, one might be confused by the economic success of the pastor or the size of the church. Thinking that a Jesuit in the pulpit can only be found in large successful churches is to misunderstand Jesuitism. Jesuits may take an oath of poverty, most do, but at no time are they bound to that oath if breaking it serves the objectives of the Jesuit general, the Pope, and the Roman Catholic Church. Conversely, they may have taken no oath of poverty, yet choose to operate in a state of poverty for the sake of appearances, or performing a particular function among poorer Christians who are repulsed by the greed evident in megachurches. Thus, the economic success of the pastor or the size of his church is no indication whether or not he is a Jesuit. The Jesuit's purpose is to affect all aspects and levels of society, and thereby cause disunity among the enemies of Rome. When a Jesuit in the pulpit senses a member of his congregation is too close to figuring things out, and perhaps influencing others in the congregation, he will invariably find a reason to accuse him or her of disunity. When the accused attempts to mount a defense, it will invariably cause polarities within the congregation, and the polarities will be deemed disunity, and then blamed on the accused. The accused will most often be humiliated, and will usually leave the congregation of their own accord. If not, they may be asked to leave, or allowed to stay, provided they keep their mouth shut. Despite observing all these earmarks of Jesuitism in your pastor, he still may not be a Jesuit in the pulpit. It is not unusual to find equally dysfunctional pastors in churches, especially in smaller cult-like congregations. Regardless of whether or not your pastor is a Jesuit, if he is behaving like one, then he is doing the work of one and is not fit to be a pastor. This leaves you with several pressing decisions. Number one, do you leave the congregation? Number two, do you confront the pastor? Number three, do you stay and shut up? These are difficult choices that you must make for yourself. However, I will tell you what I would do. I would move on. If you would like to learn more about the Jesuit infiltration of churches, I suggest a YouTube search using the name Alberto Rivera. A number of videos should come up. Alberto was a Jesuit priest who came out of the order and was later killed by the Jesuits for revealing their inner workings. The Jesuits have done much to discredit Alberto, but if you diligently do your own research, you will come to the same conclusion that I have. Alberto is credible. Thanks for listening. Please feel free to post your comments and questions.